Okay, so today guys, we're gonna go over plant versus animal cells, and the key focus today is gonna be on what we talked about a little bit in the first lesson, which is the reasons for the similarities between plant and animal cells, as well as the reasons for the differences, okay? The reason for the differences has to do with how plants and animals get their food, okay? Animals obviously get their food by consuming other organisms, be they plant or animal or both, okay? But for plants, okay, they get their food through photosynthesis. Okay? So all they need for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, okay? And then from there, they can synthesize their own food okay? and, uh, and nourish themselves. Okay, so we'll be talking about the modes of nutrition, okay? That is, if you're something that consumes other organisms or makes your own, okay? And that'll be the reason uh, for the, some of the structural differences. So we need to know and understand how plant and animal cells are different, understand why those differences are present and necessary, and be able to correct, correctly label plant and animal cells, okay? All right, so lots of subtle differences between plant and animal cells. Okay, the different modes of nutrition is where the biggest differences occur. Now, if you are an animal and you are consuming other organisms for food, you probably have to be mobile. Agreed? Food's not just, you know, generally going to come to you. Okay, now that doesn't mean that there aren't animals for whom uh, a, a sedentary life is their reality. Okay, a sponge is an animal. It doesn't move. Food just comes to it. It's what we call a filter feeder, okay? Clams and mussels and um, oysters and things like that are also animals that are stationary, okay? They attach themselves to something and food comes to them. However, they're fairly simple animals, okay? You're not going to get terribly complex or terribly large by waiting for food to come to you, okay? You do become fairly strong and large and complex by being able to chase down anything when you're hungry, okay? And that's why we see that the most complex animals tend to be the ones that have to go out and seek their food. Um, now, if you're gonna be mobile, then your cells have to be able to tolerate changes in shape, okay? If I'm gonna be chasing down, okay, a gazelle or something for my dinner, they, then I had better be fairly flexible, okay? I'd also better be fairly fast, okay? or work in a pack or whatever, or both. So in order to do that, I need to have cells that are flexible and not rigid. Conversely, if I'm a plant, I'm stuck in one place all the time, okay? This isn't the Lord of the Rings, okay? Like they don't just pick up and walk around, okay? Like, uh, what was the name? Treebeard, okay? Um, they, they can't do that. They're rooted to one location for life. So they have to be able to make their food from the resources available in that spot. Luckily, the resources that plants need are generally available in most places. Okay? We still, however, will see plants compete with each other. Now you're probably thinking that's weird. Okay? Plants competing? Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't see them playing sports or anything like that. Okay? But I don't mean competition like that. I mean competition for resources. If you're a plant that can grow really tall, do you have an advantage over a plant that can't? Okay? What are you going to get that the short plant can't? Sunlight, exactly, okay? That's one of the ways that plants compete. They try and get taller and shade out other plants. Because if they can shade out other plants, okay, those plants will die, their root systems won't be stealing nutrients from the ground, okay, that they need, right? They're gonna compete with each other in that way, okay? Plants can also um, secrete chemicals into the soil. Sweet outside, okay? Uh, plants can also secrete chemicals into the soil, okay, that can be harmful to other plants. Okay? If you've ever seen underneath a spruce tree, almost nothing grows. Okay? As their needles fall to the ground, the needles release chemicals that acidify the soil okay? and make it difficult for anything else to grow there, thus eliminating competition around the root systems. Okay? So there's all kinds of ways that plants can compete. However, plants are not mobile. So their cells need to be fairly rigid because they've got to support growth, height. Okay, and be strong enough that they don't break in the wind, okay, flexible enough that they can sway, okay, all of those kinds of things. So cellular structure okay, is gonna be obviously quite a bit different 
for a plant cell than an animal cell while still maintaining those similarities because of the processes that they share. Okay, everybody with me so far? All right, now here's the other thing that plants and animals do differently, sort of, but also have in common. Okay. What we're looking at here for a plant is that they need these raw materials. Carbon dioxide and water. Okay. When you combine those two things in the process of photosynthesis, so the energy source for this reaction is sunlight, okay, you are going to get these materials. C6, H12, O6, and oxygen. Does that reaction look a little bit familiar? Okay. What kind of reaction does it kind of look like that we learned about? Yeah, it's kind of like a combustion reaction, except it's, it's flipped. It's backwards. Okay. Photosynthesis is the opposite of a combustion reaction. Think about it. When you have a campfire, what are you burning? Wood. Where did that wood come from? tree. How did the tree make it? This. This is how it did. Okay? It used this reaction. It took carbon dioxide from the air, water from the soil, okay? and using sunlight put energy into this reaction to make glucose, sugar, okay? and oxygen, which are then the raw materials for your campfire. Okay? So now, an animal comes along and eats the plant, okay? Then this reaction happens. Except instead of requiring energy, this one gives it void. It's the opposite of the first one, okay? This reaction here, this is photosynthesis. This reaction here is cellular respiration. Okay. Plants carry out photosynthesis. They put the raw materials into the environment okay, for other organisms and for themselves. Okay. Plants don't just carry out photosynthesis for the heck of it. They need that sugar too. Okay. A plant's cells carry out cellular respiration as well. Okay. There's just extra left over that helps to feed the food chain okay, uh, that goes on around it. Okay. These two reactions okay, cause each other. Okay. When these two reactions are cycling, that's the carbon cycle. and animals are related okay, in terms of energy in their environment okay, through photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Okay, make sure you copy down those two reactions and put them in your notes. All right, so chemoheterotrophs, big long word. Okay, this is our first mode of nutrition. Okay, and what I mean by mode of nutrition is how you get your glucose. Okay, how you get your energy providing molecules. Okay, so a chemoheterotroph is an organism that consumes other organisms for food. Okay, so that could be an earthworm, okay, that's consuming like, you know, detritus and debris and the dirt, okay, that's organic that it can eat. Okay, um, a fungus, right, that's growing on decaying material or your skin. There's a pleasant thought for you. Okay. If you have athlete's foot, you have a fungus that's eating you. True, true story. Okay. If you have athlete's foot, okay, there's a fungus growing on your feet. The reason it's itchy is because it's eating you. Very slowly, but it's eating you. Okay. And a fungus okay, is a chemoheterotroph just like we are. It consumes organic material for food. That organic material can be anything. Okay. If it's Mushrooms like these, it's just decaying material in the soil. Okay? If it's a parasitic fungus, like athlete's foot, 
okay? That it's your own cells, okay? And what it does, it just puts these little um, things called hyphae. They kind of look like plant roots, okay? And it pushes them between your cells, and then it secretes digestive enzymes from there, okay? The same kind of digestive enzymes that are in your stomach. A fungus digests its food externally and then absorbs it. We digest our food internally and absorb it. Okay, so all a fungus is doing is releasing digestive enzymes that are dissolving your cell and making it edible, okay, or absorbable okay, by it. Okay, and that's why it's itchy because it's actually your cells dying and okay, being eaten. You can just rock yourself to sleep with that thought tonight. <laughs> okay, uh, and then obviously we got big predatory animals okay, also that are obviously going to consume other organisms. Okay, they're all chemoheterotrophs because they are not producing their own glucose. They are getting it from the tissue of other organisms. All right, so that means they must consume chemicals. Okay, uh, their cells are going to contain these special organelles, lysosomes. Okay, which are little things inside your cell with their own membrane, and inside of there are digestive enzymes that can break down food molecules that you eat for energy. Okay. Now, the meaning of chemoheterotroph, okay? Chemo means chemicals, hetero means other, okay? And trough is feeder. So chemical other feeder, okay? They rely on other organisms for their food. Okay? That's the breakdown of that word. All right. Now, does that mean that we can eat anything? No. Okay? There are lots of living organisms out there that we can't eat for many reasons, okay? Some of them are not healthy for us. Some of them are poisonous, okay? Um, but there are also some that even if we eat them, provide us no nourishment, okay? If we can't break down the material that they're made out of with our digestive enzymes, then they just pass right through us and we get no nutritional value from them, okay? For example, if you eat lettuce, celery, Okay, things like that, there's not a lot of food energy in those foods. They're great if you're trying to lose weight because there's not a lot of food energy in those foods, but they fill you up. Okay? The other advantage of eating things like celery and lettuce and high fiber foods like that is that we can't digest them. So they go through you pretty much unchanged, okay? which means they actually are good for your digestive tract. They act like a brush and they clean you out. Okay? That's why you're supposed to eat lots of fiber. Okay? It helps keep your intestines and your bowels healthy because it just it makes sure nothing gets stuck in there. Okay? It can be a big health problem as you age. Okay? If you have um, there's little folds in your large intestine okay? called diverticuli, and if you get stuff stuck in there, okay, it can become infected, and then you can get diverticulosis, okay? which is an inflammation of the bowels. And if it gets really bad, they have to go in and cut out a section of your bowels. So, fiber is good for you, lesson, okay? Eat your fiber, okay? Mom or dad says, eat your vegetables, eat them, okay? And keep eating them, because they're good for you, okay? Not because they contain a lot of food energy, though. We can't break down the stuff that plants are made out of, okay? Some of the stuff they are made out of, we can, okay? If I'm eating, you know, something that's really starchy, like potatoes, sure, we can break that down, that's no problem. But the skin, nope, we can't digest that, we can't break that down, okay? So it's gonna go through us, pretty much unchanged and act like fiber, okay? So um, as carnivores or omnivores ourselves, we can't really get much out of that. But a cow, which eats nothing but grass, can, okay? They have a four-chambered stomach that works a lot different than ours that allows them to break down plant-based material for food energy, okay? All right, everybody understand what's meant by chemoheterotrophs? All right, so within an animal cell, okay, we're going to have certain organelles, okay? Some of them are unique to animals, like the lysosome, okay? Plants don't have any need for lysosomes because they don't eat, okay? They make their own food energy, okay, so they're not going to contain lysosomes, okay? Animal cells don't have a cell wall because that would make them rigid and inflexible, okay? And they, animals wouldn't be able to move very well, okay? Animal cells also have something called a cytoskeleton. Okay, which are kind of long, elastic, fibrous materials okay, that attach to the inside of the cell membrane. So when a cell changes shape, they almost act like a bungee cord and keep it from going too far and rupturing. 
Okay? So we have this cytoskeleton that helps maintain their structure and flexibility. Okay? So there's a few things okay, in an animal cell that are not going to be found in a plant cell. Okay? Um, so we got that need for mobility. Okay? Um, animal cells also have only flexible outer membrane. Okay? No cell wall. Now, when it comes to plants, okay, like I said, plants operate differently, right? Plants do not have to move around in order to get their food, okay? Their food comes to them in the form of sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, okay? Um, so, they are going to capture sunlight, and they're going to take carbon dioxide, they split it, they also split water, okay? That's what the energy from the sun is used to do, okay? And then they are reassembled as glucose and free oxygen, okay? Um, so any organisms that can make their own food using just the sun are known as photoautotrophs. So photo means light, auto means self, and trough means feeding. So they're light self feeders. I think the basis for that. Okay. So. Since animals don't have any cellular machinery for photosynthesis, their cells look different, obviously, than plant cells do, which do have the machinery for carrying out photosynthesis. I mean, it would be sweet if we had the ability to carry out photosynthesis, because if you got hungry and there wasn't any food around, you just have to walk outside in the sun. Okay? Then you wouldn't feel hungry anymore, which would be convenient. Okay? Um, the euglena that you looked at yesterday is actually a photosynthetic organism that can move, okay? Called the protist, okay? They're rare, okay? very rare to have an, an organism that can do that, okay? It isn't a plant, it isn't an animal, it's a protist, okay? Single-celled organism that can carry out photosynthesis but has a tail on it that it can whip and it moves along, okay, uh, that way. So it's always swimming towards the light, okay, um, in order to carry out photosynthesis. All right, so anything that can do that, like I said, is a photoautotroph. Right. Now, photoautotrophs have to have okay, special cellular structures called chloroplasts. Okay. Chloroplasts are where you can find chlorophyll. Okay. When we look at plant cells next week, you'll be able to see the chloroplasts, okay? They're a fairly obvious organelle, okay? There's lots of them in each and every plant cell, okay? So they are something that you'll readily be able to observe, okay, in the plant cells that we look at, okay? So they're kind of um, ovoid, almost like a, like an artisan type of bread, okay? Like if you've ever had like a sour piece of, like a big sourdough loaf, okay? That's kind of how they're shaped, okay? Just kind of like a circle, okay? Um, and then they've got these things inside that look like stacks of like poker chips, okay? But they're green, okay? They're the, called the thylakoids, which is where the chlorophyll is, and that's where photosynthesis happens, is inside of those, okay? So you'll see those in lots of places within the cells, okay? Of, of plants. Okay, the other thing you're gonna see in plants is the stiff cell wall. Now, it's the cell wall that we can't digest, okay? cows and other herbivores can, but we can't, okay? Given our, our uh, complement of digestive enzymes and our one-chambered stomach, okay, we can't digest the stuff that this is made out of, which is cellulose. Cellulose is dietary fiber, okay? So, I don't know, maybe you or your parents, maybe they have Metamucil, okay? Metamucil contains psyllium fiber, which is basically the husks, okay, of grain, which are made of cellulose which we can't digest, okay? They're just ground down, okay? And when you put water in them, and that orange flavoring, it's like drinking chunky tang, okay? And uh, yeah, it just goes through like a brush. You can't, you can't digest it. Same with corn. Okay, can't digest corn, the husk anyway of corn. All right, also within the plant cell that you're not gonna find in an animal cell is this thing a single large water vacuole, okay? And the water vacuole works to support the cell from the inside, okay? So you got the cell wall that's like a frame on the outside, right? And then you've got this um, water vacuole on the inside. And the water vacuole is kind of like a, it's like a water balloon, 
Okay? If a water balloon has a lot of water in it, it can be fairly rigid. Okay? Still flexible, but it can exert pressure. Okay? And that's what the water vacuole does, is it pushes everything in the cell against the cell wall, supporting it from inside. Okay? Everybody kind of with me there? All right, so either one of these things on their own can't support the cell's shape. But when they work together, they can keep a plant rigid and upright. Okay? You've all seen what a plant looks like if it's starting to get kind of, if it hasn't been watered for quite a while, it starts to wilt. Okay? It starts to get kind of limp looking. It's not dead yet, but it's limp. Okay? If you water it, it'll come back. Okay? Well, what's happening when it wilts and gets all limp looking is the water vacuoles have emptied. And once they're empty, they can't push on the cell wall enough for the cell to, for the plant to support itself and so the plant gets all droopy. Okay? When they get filled back up, the plant will go right back up again. Okay? If the plant is crunchy, it's too late. Okay? It's beyond saving at that point. Alright, everybody okay with this idea of the photoautotrophs and these two things that are in a plant cell that are not in an animal cell? Okay? So that's the big thing to know. Cell wall, only in plant cells, okay? and uh, water vacuole, only in plant cells. Now, if we're comparing the two, there's obviously way more in common than there is different. Okay? So if I'm looking at uh, things that are uh, common to both, okay? they both have okay, this here. Okay? They both have this. I'm not naming anything yet. Okay? They both have this stuff. Okay? They both have uh, this stuff here. Okay? They both have one of these. Okay? They both have um, these things here. Those are all the same. Okay. They are also both filled with a fluid called cytoplasm. Okay. So they have that. Right. They both have a cell membrane. Okay. For the plant cell, it's just inside the cell wall. So we got a lot of green check marks there for things that are in common. Yeah. Okay. And that's just the structures. We're not even looking at the processes that these cells carry out that are similar. Okay, we're exactly the same in a lot of cases. Okay, things that are different. Okay, lysosome, centriole, that's different. Okay, plant cell, water vacuole, chloroplast. Okay, we got four things that are different, and I don't even know how many green check marks we had, a whole bunch more, okay, that are in common. Right? So they share a lot of processes. The only thing that's different is different because of how they get their food. Okay? Animal cells have to be flexible because they've got to move. Plant cells can be rigid and they need the chloroplasts in order to carry out photosynthesis. Okay? Everybody all right with that? All right, so these little structures here that I put the red check mark on, okay? these are called centrioles. We don't see them in plant cells. We only see them in animal cells. Okay? The reason we see them in animal cells has to do with the fact that the, an animal cell's shape can change and change often okay, because of mobility. So what these things do is they help when the cell is dividing. Okay? When the cell is about to divide, the first thing it does is it copies all of its DNA okay? so that each new cell will have a copy of everything. Okay. What the centrioles do is they go to either end of the cell, once the DNA has been copied, the DNA all lines up down the middle of the cell. And the centrioles will put out these fibers that are almost like cables that will attach to the DNA. Okay. And what they do is they make sure that each new cell is going to get a copy of each piece of DNA. Okay. And that way, if the cell changes or twists during the division, each cell's got something holding on to all the DNA that it needs. Because if it didn't, and the cell changed shape, it'd be possible for one cell to get more DNA than the other. Right? And that's fatal. Okay? If one cell gets more DNA, that's bad. If one cell gets less DNA, that's obviously bad. Because what does your DNA do? It makes you, okay? It's instructions for doing everything that that cell needs to do. If the cell doesn't get all those instructions, there are gonna be things it can't do, and that will probably result in its death, okay? 
we can actually see that the issues with this sometimes in a full-grown person. Okay, if we're looking at something like um, trisomy 21, okay, that causes Down's syndrome. How many people know what Down's syndrome is? Okay, all right. So if someone has Down syndrome, they kind of have obvious physical, okay, um, and um, like psychological developmental problems, right? Okay. A person who has Down syndrome used the term we used to use was mentally retarded, which is terrible now when you think about it, but that's what we used to call that. Okay? Down syndrome results in an abnormal formation of the brain, abnormal um, physical features, okay? and um, people with Down syndrome typically don't live like a full normal lifespan either, because they'll end up with problems with their organs. And that's the result of having too much DNA. Trisomy 21 means you have three copies of chromosome 21. Normally, you have two copies of everything. Okay? A person with trisomy 21 has three copies of one of your 23 chromosomes. Okay? And it causes all of those developmental issues. There are a bunch of other trisomies out there. Most of them result in like, either the, the fetus dying in utero or uh, the baby dying like, shortly after being born. Okay? They're pretty, there's some pretty scary uh, trisomies out there. Okay? And they all have major okay, health consequences. So having the right amount of genetic material is really important, and that's the role of the centrioles, is to make sure that each cell gets all the DNA it's supposed to get. Okay. All right, plants don't need those because their cell shape is rigid and fixed. It's not going to twist or do anything funny while it's dividing. Okay, so they don't have any need for those, but plants do. Or sorry, animals do. Okay, questions there. All right. I want you guys to write down some answers for those questions, and then we're going to go through them together, and that'll probably take us close to the end of class. I'll hand out the cell diagrams, but we won't get to labeling them until Monday. Don't worry. Don't do them at home, okay? Because everybody calls everything something different, okay? Um, so we'll, we'll label them all together on Monday. Okay, so question number one. It's the main reason for the differences between plant and animal cells. Three words. modes of nutrition. Okay, You could have also written how they get their food or how they get their energy or something like that. But when it comes down to it, we call that their mode of nutrition. Okay? How do they get their glucose? How do they get their food energy? Okay? They're either a chemoheterotroph or they're a photoautotroph. Okay? And that's why there are differences between plant and animal cells. Okay, Question number two, what organelle supplies plants with energy? What process does it use? What was the green one called? Started with C. Chloroplasts, yeah, okay. Chloroplasts is what supplies the plant with food and it carries out photosynthesis, yeah. Okay, and what organelle supplies animal cells with energy and how does it do this? And it started with an L. Somebody whispered it. Lysosome, yeah. Okay. Lysosome does this by breaking down materials into simpler molecules like glucose. Okay. That's its job. It's basically the stomach of the cell. Um, and then for number four, transport within plant and animal cells is done in the same fashion. Okay. Why would this have been kept the same, evolutionarily speaking, when so many other things have been altered? Okay, so plants and animals transport materials within themselves in the same, within their cells, in the same way. Okay. From an evolutionary perspective, why would they still do it the same way? People often don't get this one because the answer is so simple. Because it, it works. Exactly. Okay. From an evolutionary perspective, you only see a change in how something is done or how something looks if there's an advantage to it. Okay. Natural selection selects the processes and structures and abilities that result in the highest likelihood of passing on your genetic material. Okay. If you survive better, you have more offspring. Your genes end up in the pool more often, okay. and you can see a slow change in how a species looks because of that. 
Okay? That's how natural selection causes the process of evolution. Okay? It's looking for superior ways of doing things. Okay? Those come along very rarely. It's why evolution is such a slow process. Okay? Very rarely does something come along that is better than what is already there. Okay? There's lots of things that come along that are worse, and those organisms usually perish before they have a chance to pass on their genetic material. Okay? Which is, that's how natural selection is supposed to work. You get selected, you don't, you live, you die, your genes get passed on, yours don't. It's a harsh natural world to live in. Okay? But that's how natural selection works. Okay? If I'm a, a wolf and I get born and I don't see very well, I'm not going to live. It's as, that, it's as simple as that. And if I don't live long enough to pass on my genes, then whatever genetic anomaly gave me bad eyesight won't get passed on. And that's good okay, for everybody else in the future. I know that sounds really harsh, but that's how nature works. All right, and number five, nutritional needs are different. Okay, which would have survived best in a primordial Earth? So very early in Earth's history, which would have been more likely to be present, plants or animals? Absolutely, okay? Plants could use the raw materials that were available, carbon dioxide and sunlight and water. If you were an animal living at that time, unless you ate rocks, okay, there wasn't much for you to eat. All right, we'll leave it there, guys.